The scripture for today is found in the book of Luke, chapter 12, verse 49, 53, in the NAS. And the word of God says, I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. For from now on, five members in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, Mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. This is the word of God for the children of God. Thanks be to God. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This morning we come together to bring a conclusion, a close to this seven-week sermon series that where we have every week been talking about God's reckless love. And that seems like a strange term when you step back But when you really think about it, God's love for us is, from a human perspective, seemingly reckless. I mean, the way He loves us and even why He loves us, we know for a fact that if the shoe were on the other foot, we would not do what God has done. We would not believe it would be worth it, the sacrifice and the suffering, to save us who still in our lives prove ourselves over and over again to be disobedient to what He desires, rebellious in our hearts. God truly does have a reckless love for us, the kind of love that in which He was willing and has shown Himself to be committed to even suffering that He might have us as His children. So the challenge for us as we bring this series to a close is to draw it together What does it mean for our lives? Will we remember what we've learned in these last few weeks? How will my life be different in light of God's love for me as I now understand it? The text we have before us this morning speaks of a reckless love and, in honesty, a reckless life. And we see this in Jesus And he says to us, he wants to see this in us. How we live our lives is to be reckless in our love for God and our love for one another, even as his love and life have been reckless for us. The text is easily divided into two sections. There is the first two verses which apply directly to Jesus and the remainder of the text that applies to us. So I want you to listen to the words of Jesus this morning. He says, I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. We have this image of Jesus being meek and mild, tender and gentle. And that's true in many cases. But the words of our text this morning are not meek and mild. I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. These are powerful words, strong words. You ever gone to a baseball game and sat really close to home plate? When the pitcher winds up and throws, you can hear the crack of that ball hitting the catcher's mitt. It's not a gentle sound. It's a sound of power. And Jesus says, I've come to cast fire upon the earth. He's not talking about a gentle little flame. He's talking about a blazing inferno. The kind that consumes everything. That's what he's come into this world to do. It's kind of like a forest fire. You want to know why? You want to understand why is Jesus talking like this? What happens when a, when a forest catches fire? Everything is burned and consumed, but then a short time later, the forest is reborn. See, Jesus is telling us, I've come to change the world. It's not going to be easy. At times, it's even going to be painful. But this is my purpose in coming. I've come to cast fire upon the earth. The earth is going to be changed. 
because I've come into this world. And then he says something that, I'm going to be honest with you, for decades now, I overlooked it. I just didn't pay attention. It's right there in black and white. What he says, he says, I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Jesus tells us he's come with a purpose and there's something in store for him. I have a baptism to undergo. He's not talking about the baptism of, uh, that John gave him in the Jordan River when he began his ministry. This baptism in the context is to be overwhelmed, to be consumed. It's like being thrust underwater and drowned. It's going to take everything that he is. It's going to consume him until nothing is left. That's why he's come. And then he says, how distressed I am until it is accomplished. How would you define the word distressed? Jesus is telling us that he is experiencing emotional anguish. He's living with the reality of what is coming in his life. And it's not easy. I'm going to share something with you that hopefully this doesn't put you off. I've been asked many, many times over the last 30 years, do you like being a pastor? And I always say yes, because I do. But it's never, yes, yay, let's start the party. <laughs> it's more of a subdued yes. And I don't want you to get me wrong, I do love being a pastor. But I don't always enjoy the things that a pastor is called to do. Yes, there are wonderful, wonderful times of fellowship and, and celebrations, things that are encouraging to our hearts. But I've also experienced things that I can only call uh, the great grief of the soul. It's not easy, it's not a happy time to sit with a grieving spouse for hours on end. Grieving even before someone dies as you watch cancer ravage a body. To see the, the pain and anguish in the heart of a spouse and children as the one they love slowly is taken from them because of a horrible disease. There are no smiles on the faces or happy thoughts at that moment, only grief and heartache. It's not easy to walk with a spouse through a divorce or to experience the anguish of an affair or to sit with parents because their child has been arrested and is sitting in jail. Or to hold someone's hand and pray with them as they die. To be the last person with them this side of heaven. Great anguish of the soul is an honest feeling. And it's things that every pastor who's doing his job correctly will experience. Jesus understood that. And I can tell you, on an honest note, being a pastor is not something I would have chosen for my life because none of us like doing those kinds of things. But again, being a pastor is not a choice, it's a calling. Just like Jesus, when he came into this world, he came with a purpose. He was going to undergo a baptism. He was going to experience things in this world that he accepted in eternity and were the calling on his life when he was born in this world and how distressed he was until it was accomplished. He lived every day understanding what faced him in this world. You ever go to sleep at night and have a dream? You dream of the future? You have this dream of what's going to happen in your life. Maybe you're halfway asleep and halfway daydreaming in that awkward moment when you're just kind of drifting off and thinking about all the things that can be. Can you imagine what Jesus' dreams were like? The crack of a whip, the ping of steel upon steel, the sound of metal tearing through flesh. I don't think we'd call it a dream. More appropriately, we'd call it a nightmare. Jesus lived with the reality of understanding exactly when and how he was going to die. And yet every day he got up and took one more step closer to the cross. 
His death on the cross was fire being cast upon the earth. It was God working to accomplish something new in this world. This world is not the same because Jesus lived, died, and rose again. This world is different because He has brought judgment into this world. Sin has been judged, and sin has been forgiven by the blood He shed on the cross. The world is supposed to be a different place today than it was before He came. And that's where we come in. The first two verses of our text apply directly to Jesus. The rest and remainder of the text apply to each of us. Jesus tells us, Do you suppose I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. For from now on, five members of one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Not peace but division. Jesus tells us my coming into this world is going to cause the world to be different. And it's not going to bring peace on earth like you think. We live in a society today where everybody wants unity. Everybody wants harmony. We live in a society that has become so politically correct that no divergence in opinion is allowed. Unity at the expense of everything, even the truth. And this is what has happened in the church, not just in America, but around the world. We're willing to sacrifice the truth for a sense of unity and peace, which is no peace at all. Jesus tells us he did not come into this world to establish peace on earth. In fact, he tells us, my coming into this world is going to cause division, even to the very depths of our most intimate relationships, even with our families. And that's a reality that we have to accept. And it's not easy. There was a young girl, not young girl, but a lady named Annie. She became a Christian. She went and told her family, I become a Christian, and next week on Sunday during the service, I'm going to be baptized, and there will be hundreds of people there. Her parents looked at her and said, you are such a disappointment. You've become an embarrassment to our family. There was another girl, I'm trying to get their names right because I don't want to misrepresent them, named Betty, who went to her parents and told her family, her parents, that she had become a Christian, she would given her life to Christ, and her father very bluntly and methodically said, as of this day, you are no longer my daughter. And then Janice went to her mom and sat down with her and said, Mom, my life's different now. I want you to understand, you didn't know what I was doing. The drinking, the drugs, the sex. You didn't know how I was living my life, but I've stopped all that now because I understand that God loves me in Jesus and I'm going to live my life for him, so I'm not going to live the way I used to live. And Janice's mom very slowly said, I wish you were the way you used to be. See, each one of these young ladies was devastated by the response of their family to the fact that they had become a Christian. But this is exactly what Jesus was telling us. The fact is that when Christians are living out their Christian faith, there are those who are going to hate them because of it. And there are those who are going to reject them. And most are simply going to ignore them. The reality is that Jesus brings division. You understand that, don't you? Don't we all have those family members? who could care less about the church, about Jesus or faith. And we've made decisions about those relationships, haven't we? When we get together with them, we don't talk about religion because we'd rather have unity and peace in the family. So we don't talk about religion when we're with those people. We play nice. And yet Jesus tells us his coming is going to bring division even in the midst of our families. Why is that? 
Because there needs to be a clear distinction. People need to know the truth. They need to understand who Jesus is and what He has done. Do you realize Jesus says, I've come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it was already kindled. He was anxious to get to the cross. Why? Because He wanted heaven to be yours. He loved you enough that He wanted heaven to be yours. And He was anxious and excited to get the job done, no matter what it took. And yet, we play nice for the sake of peace and unity. When God wants us to bring people to the point of understanding it's one way or the other, not give them a false sense of security, false sense of hope, a false sense of peace, which is no peace at all. Jesus came into this world to give us peace with God. That's what His death and resurrection accomplished. And sometimes it's knowing we have peace with God is the only thing that gets us through a day. So the issue that comes down to us when we talk about reckless love is who do we love? Who do we love most? Do we love ourselves? Are we wanting a carefree, peaceful life? Or do we have a reckless love for Jesus? A passionate love for Him and for His mission? How are we now going to live in light of Jesus' love for us? That's ultimately the question as we bring this sermon series to a close. I hate to be blunt, but in the same way we need to be honest with our families, we need to be honest with each other. What are you looking for? You want peace and harmony? You want a smooth road in your life no matter what? Then I'm afraid you're in the wrong place. Overall, Fodry in your business 20 is the country club. You can join that and have peace and harmony and unity all you want, I think. But if you're going to be part of the church of Jesus Christ in the world, you're not going to experience peace and harmony this side of eternity. You're called to have a radical, reckless love for everyone. A reckless love for Jesus where your heart is passionately in love with Him and He is the highest priority in your life. A reckless love for people to the point that you would willingly sacrifice all that you are and even become the scourge of the earth so that they know who Jesus is for them. It's what Jesus did. It's what Jesus calls us to. It's not easy. Sometimes it's not pleasant. Sometimes it's painful. But it's who we are called to be. And the reason I share this with you is because it's exactly what Jesus did. It's exactly what Jesus said. And this reckless love is the only thing that can save our world. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, Keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord, and to life everlasting, depart in peace. Amen.